close your eyes and imagine you're in the starting end of a 400 meter dash. Boom! You hear a gunshot go off and you immediately start running. You know you're not the fastest in your group. However, you reach the finish line before anyone else does. Weird, right? Then you look back and see that one of your competitors is running barefoot. The other one is blind. And the other one is missing a leg. This is the principle of privilege. According to the Oxford Dictionary, privilege is a special right, advantage, or immunity granted only to a particular person or group of people. Examples of privilege may include gender, race, socioeconomic, religious, sexual orientation, among many, many others. I fit into these five main examples as a person being favored. And I was practically born into it, meaning that none of them were my decisions. Privilege can play a role in our lives without us even noticing. I remember the particular day when my mom was. I was about eight years old, and at that time I was my same competitive self. I used to play tennis back then, and I remember being frustrated. I would constantly go to tournaments and always lose. My goal at the time was to win a trophy. That was all I wanted. And it felt like I was constantly letting myself down. There was this boy in particular, to preserve anonymity, let's call him Marco, who I could never beat. He was a ball boy who spent most of his day in a court, and therefore had lots of time to practice. Whenever I reached the finals of a tournament, it was against him, and he always won. Then, one day I was thrilled because I'd been practicing a lot and had reached the finals of this tournament, and it was against him. They called their game. 10 minutes passed, 20 minutes passed, 30 minutes passed, and he didn't show up. I ended up winning by default and received my first trophy. That moment, that I had thought I would be excited and proud of myself, I was bothered by the fact that he didn't arrive. Later that week, I encountered him while I was practicing and curiously asked him why he missed her much. My heart sunk with his response. He had been working as a ball boy that morning. However, he did not earn enough money to pay a taxi fare to take him to the tournament. A taxi fare. An eight-year-old boy. That boy had to work for everything in his life, while I could have done whatever I pleased. This, uh, this marked my life. Me, an upper-class eight-year-old who had never had to worry about money or transportation, was shocked that a boy slightly younger than me already had to provide for himself. This was a turning point in my life, because I started acknowledging my privilege. I started noticing how people treated me differently and how easy things were for me because of the position I was born into. And how there were other people who had to work so hard for the things they had. This is what I like to call the first step to putting our privilege to good use. Acknowledging it. This doesn't mean to brag about it or to show it off, but to simply be aware of what you have. Privilege, like everything else in life, comes and goes. One moment you can be at the top of the world, and the next you might be at rock bottom. For example, your family might suffer from a financial crisis from one day to another, and you might have to adjust to a new way of living. Personally, if I found myself in this situation, I would feel powerless, because when I come to think about it, most of my daily activities, like going to school or simply eating lunch, might change. My school could become too expensive, and I might not have what I eat, the money to eat what I like every day. That's where our dependency and privilege comes to play. If we think back to all the opportunities we've had, are all of them based on merit? Or have they been swayed by our own privilege? And if they have been swayed, and we later lose that privilege, what does that mean for us? This is what we have to be conscious about. By a raise of hands, how many people have heard these words or a variation of them? Eat your food, because there's a starving child in Africa. As a child, I didn't really find the relationship between these phrases. But later, as I grew up, I grasped the meaning. It was more than eating our food. 
It was, it was about using the opportunities we have to create change. You have a school? Learn. You have a voice? Speak up. You have a platform? Stand up for what's right. Because it's always more than a starving African child. It's about the 821 million people who go to sleep hungry every day. The 264 million children who don't have access to education. And the 39,000 girls a day who are forced into child marriage. Once you grasp this like I did, you understand that you should always finish your food. You should always take advantage of your education. And that you should always speak up. If not for you, for those people who can't. Because we shouldn't only be appreciative of our privilege, we should act on it, embrace it, and consciously know what it means. Privilege is an unfair advantage that we use without consciously knowing. And we would be fools if we didn't use it. Emphasis in the word use, because there's a thin line between using privilege and abusing it. We should use our privilege to educate ourselves. As Nelson Mandela once said, Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Education is critical in the subject because what we know about privilege will impact what we do with it. Every opportunity that arises should be seized and any chance that appears should be taken. The main obstacle people face when trying to succeed is justification. Excuses to justify where we fall short are merely a way of complaining. How many times have we blamed our misfortunes on someone else's success? The same principle applies for privilege. You can't say that you don't have it because you're privileged by having a family and by being able to read, by having the ability to walk, or by simply being alive. You cannot deny that you have some kind of privilege the same as you cannot deny that some people might have more or less than you. However, we cannot start playing the blaming game. We cannot blame one specific person or group of people. It's the system. Part of our society is to blame for these injustices. Because privilege, despite its connotation, is not always possible. The same way you can use privilege to your advantage, you can also misuse it or not use it at all. I attend one of the best private schools in Nicaragua. And I've heard so many people say, why should I study, go to school or college, if my parents already have enough money to provide for me for the rest of my life? These privileged counterproductive thoughts are related to the misusages of privilege. How many artists have lost themselves and their fortunes in drugs and alcohol? How many people have misused their talents in exchange for money? How many people are unaware or simply ignorant to their own privilege? So, what should we do with our free time? Well, one of the best advice I can give you is to educate yourself. Anytime you have some time off, learn about all the privileges you have. Personally, what I did was to join a debate club, in which we acted as heads of different countries, combining our efforts to solve global and regional problems. And many times, we discuss topics like racism, sexism, prejudice, and human rights. What I learned from these debates was that more often than not, governments around the world didn't have the major influence. The public did. This realization made me aware that the attitude and actions of individuals, like me and you, as a collective, are far more impactful than those of an imposing entity, because rules are nothing if no one follows them. Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote a book called The Social Contract, where he points out that we all have different capabilities. Then he goes on and states that each member of the community gives himself to it at the moment of its foundation, saying that whether we like it or not, we are part of a group larger than ourselves. And that with every community, there has to be some type of commitment from its members. Commitment in our communities should be a way of helping out the people who need it the most. I classify these into two categories. Money and time. Money, which is the way most people give back, by putting money in a can or writing a big check to a foundation, does help out. I'm not going to say it doesn't. 
But it's like Tracy Peter said in his book, Mountains Beyond Mountains. The world is full of miserable places. One way of living comfortably is not to think about them. Or when you do, to send money. Meaning that by sending money, we get the satisfaction of helping out by distancing ourselves from the problem. To avoid this, there is the other category. Time. Time, which is a less sought-after way of giving back, is often the most effective. Activities like volunteering have a greater impact on the community and help the volunteer become aware of problems that would otherwise be overlooked. Now, I'm not saying to stop donating to charity, because to make change, money is essential most of the time. My goal is for you to become aware. So, know where your money is going. Learn about the problem at hand, and maybe find a more personal way of helping out that cause. Because in this ever-expanding world, it is easy to lose focus on why we're helping. And that's what we have to ask ourselves. Are we doing it for the people we're serving? Or to feel good about ourselves? And to all the busy people out there with no time to spare, what are you prioritizing? Your comfort? Now, we all have different outlooks on life. The way I see it is as an opportunity to make things better than they were handed to us by our ancestors. And the only way I see that happening is if we take some time off from thinking about ourselves and use that time for the common well-being. I'll give you an example. I am a very busy person who enjoys being occupied, and therefore it is not always easy to find time to give back. After some searching, I found the remedy. There is such a thing called service learning, where students learn through service. Last year, my human geography class took a field trip to Fabreto, an organization that helps distribute food to those people who cannot provide it for themselves, while learning about food insecurity inside the classroom. Also, in my Catholic formation class, we went to mission to rural parts of Nicaragua in order to reach people who would normally be unreachable. Because of these innovative ways of learning, occupied students such as me were able to experience service while also learning about theoretical content that would otherwise be distant. That is why I encourage teachers to engage students in these innovative ways of learning to help them serve our community and students to advocate for their community and take the initiative to serve others, which would be the final step to using our privilege for a purpose that benefited those who lacked the opportunities to thrive alone. There are four steps to using our privilege and putting it to good use. First, acknowledge your privilege. Let yourself know that and be modest about it. Second, appreciate it and never take it for granted. Learn to use it, but don't depend on it. Third, take advantage of it and educate yourself. Learn to use it, but don't abuse it. And most importantly, prioritize and serve others by letting them have the same opportunities you have. You win the race. But after realizing the unfairness of it, you begin to acknowledge your privilege. But you go visit the three other people you raised with. And to the barefoot one, you give her new shoes. To the blind one, you help her run in a straight line. And to the one missing a leg, you help him build a prosthetic limb to run with. And the next time you race, it will be a fair race, in which you might not win. But as American boxer Mark Miro said, life is not about winning the race. Life is about finishing that race and how many people we can help finish this race. Thank you.